Hello campers, Barrett Hill, and welcome back to the most unique summer of Barrett Hill experiences that anyone has ever had. Well, maybe except for if you want to count that first summer that Uncle Johnny lived on the property in that tar paper shack and milled all of his lumber by hand with a chainsaw. That sounds pretty unique and pretty epic. Uh, also pretty deadly if you have been to the Barrett Hill Museum and you have seen that chainsaw they used. But never mind all of that for now. Uh, my name is Ernie Bowman, and I have never milled lumber by hand with a chainsaw, but I was scheduled to be the chapel speaker for a week of junior high camp at Barrick Hill on July 13th. I was super bummed when the announcement came that summer camp would be canceled. Uh, but as I watched that video announcement, I was also super proud to be associated with Camp Barrick Hill. Uh, it wasn't Paul's sincerity in making the announcement that blew me away, or even his relentless smile. Everybody already knows that Paul is a super sincere guy who just never stops smiling. And if you watch that video, you actually saw him smile while choking up, which I would have thought to have been biologically impossible. But no, it was the message Paul brought that made me proud to be part of Camp Barakel. This is what he said. He said, our true mission has never been to just run a summer camp. Our mission has always been to proclaim what Jesus has done for us and to urge people to worship him with their whole lives through the gladness of radical obedience. You see, Camp Barakel is a tool in the hands of Jesus' church to proclaim his good news, to make disciples of his people. And so when Paul called to ask if I would record a chapel video for the summer, uh, I think I said yes before he could even finish his sentence. I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to interrupt the director, but I was just so eager to be part of Barakel again that I just said yes right away. Uh, if you don't have a Bible in front of you, please press pause for a moment on the video and go get one, and then find 1 Kings 18 in it. Uh, 1 Kings 18 recounts Elijah's challenge to the people of Israel about faithfulness to God. But before we get to 1 Kings 18, we have a thing we need to do. Uh, I had this thing planned for every day in chapel while we were at camp, then we're going to try and do a virtual version of it right now. If you've ever been to Barakel before, you know that the chapel is divided into three sections, left, right, and center, as I'm looking at them. I had planned to start every evening chapel with a small exercise based on that three-fold division of seats, right, left, right, and center, uh, and then one question for you, uh, so we're in chapel. As I was looking out at you from the front of the chapel, I was going to label each section of the chapel. The section on my left would have been labeled as the yes with an exclamation point section. The middle section of the chapel would have been the meh, sure, I mean, I guess, section. And then the section on the right would have been the no, period, section. You got that? Yes with an exclamation point, meh, sure, yes, and no, period. And then I would ask you a question each evening, uh, and you would sort yourselves out into the appropriate sections of the chapel based on your response. We obviously can't do that now because my office here isn't big enough to fit us all in, but we can still play that game and fast forward. So get a piece of paper, something to write on. As I give you the questions, you write down your answers. You're writing down yes with an exclamation point, meh, I guess, and no, period. You ready? Okay, question number one, do you like sports? At this point in chapel, you would have all sorted yourselves, you have to stand up and mix all around the room to get into the right section for your answer. For our game today, just write down your answer of yes, meh, or no, okay? Question two, do you like drinking coffee? Question number three, are you looking forward to going back to school? Question number four, do you willingly eat kale? I've heard some people do. And question number five, do you enjoy art class? I didn't say do you take art class, I said do you enjoy it? So here's what you're going to do with your answers. I have a stack of books here. Uh, these are books that I had purchased in order to bring to camp and give them away to you. Not to all of you, I only have five books. Only five of you are going to get a book. Uh, we don't have camp, but I still have this stack of books. I still want to give them away. Before I tell you how, let me tell you about the books themselves. 
Uh, this first one is the book where I learned that story about Uncle Johnny and the chainsaw. It's called Barakel God's Miracle, and it tells the story of Camp Barakel's founding in the words of its founder. Reading this book is basically like sitting around a campfire listening to Uncle Johnny tell stories. The only way it gets better than that is if marshmallows were included. Sadly, they're not. Second book. It's closest to the theme we would have read from the Bible all week long together in chapel. It's called Not a Fan by Kyle Eidelman, and the subtitle says it all. It says, Becoming a Completely Committed Follower of Jesus. Student edition. Super helpful, easy to read, you'll love it. Hey, book number three is the shortest book of the five, and the only fiction book in the group. Legend of the Wapa is a novel about a missionary named Ian and his adventures of trying to bring God's word to a jungle tribe that has never heard of the one true God. The best part about this book actually might be on the back. On the back is where our very own Paul Gardner provides an endorsement for the book. I wrote the book. Paul agreed to read it for me before it was published, and when he was done, he wrote some nice things about it. I am maybe more pleased to have Paul's endorsement than almost anyone else's. Book number four is called Do Hard Things by Alex and Brett Harris. This book will teach you how to lead a rebellion, a rebellion against low expectations. The world is going to be happy if you can get through school without failing too many classes or doing too many drugs. God has higher hopes for you than that. Rebel against the pathetically low expectations of the world. This book will tell you how. Book number five is called Transformed by Truth by Catherine Forster. Why and how to read the Bible for yourself as a teen. Pretty simple, pretty self-explanatory, super helpful book, right? Those are the five books I have to give away. Here's how we're going to do it. At the end of the video today, I'll tell you what I think the biggest challenge facing a Christian junior high student is right now. What you need to do then is take your answers to the five questions I asked earlier, add my statement from the end of the video about what the biggest challenge for Christian junior hires is, and then email it all to me. When you email it to me, please make absolutely sure to include your parents as well. The email should be addressed to both me and your parents with their permission. That is crucial. I cannot respond to any emails. I can't count any emails that come to me from a camper only. You have to get your parents' permission. You have to include them in the email. The best thing to do would actually be send it from your parents' email with their permission so there's not a question. But if you use your own email, be sure to include your parents as well. My email address is erniebowman15 at gmail.com and you have until July 17th to email me your answers. When I wake up on July 18th, I will put all of the emails I have received, I'll print them out, I'll put them in a hat, and I'm just going to pick out five of them. When you email me, be sure and include your post office mailing address, because I will mail one book to each of those five students whose papers I draw. Once again, my email address is erniebowman15 at gmail.com. That's E-R-N-I-E-B-O-W-M-A-N-1 at gmail.com. And you need to include your answers to my five previous questions, your mailing address, and the statement from the end of the video. Okay? Now we've taken care of all of that, we can get into 1 Kings 18. Get your Bible out. 1 Kings 18, I'm going to start reading in verse 20. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet for the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us, and let them choose one bull for themselves, and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And you call on the name of your God. I will call on the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire. He is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first, for you are many and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. 
And they took the bowl that was given them, and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning till noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. There was no voice, no one answered. And they limped around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is musing, or he is relieving himself, or he's on a journey. Perhaps he's asleep and must be wakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation. But there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two seahs of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, Fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, Do it a second time. They did it a second time. He said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me that this people may know that you are O Lord, our God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. The background to these events is that the people of Israel, led by their king, had become chronically unfaithful to God. They worshipped idols. They had ignored God who created them. They had totally turned their back on him and gone their own way without him. Elijah was God's prophet, and he had been trying to call the people back to God through repentance. And so he set up this showdown between God, their creator, and Baal, the chief idol of the people. Look back at verse 21, and you can see the crucial question at hand for the people. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. The people of Israel were limping between two opinions about God, Elijah said. Some days they felt like following God, other days not so much. If you had asked the Israelite people, Do you want to live for God? they would have been right smack in the middle. Meh, sure, I mean, I guess. They wouldn't say yes, and they wouldn't say no. They just sort of limped around spiritually between the two. Elijah was going to force them to see that wasn't an option. They had to pick. Are you with God, or are you opposed to God? When it comes to life with God in this world, Elijah would tell you there is no option for meh. In 1 Kings 18, the people didn't see that yet, but Elijah was going to make it clear enough for them. Look back at verse 23. Let two bulls be given to us. Let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. You call upon the name of your God. I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Elijah had had enough of meh. He lays out the terms for what's going to happen and everyone agrees. Whichever God answers by fire, they say, we will serve him with a yes. We know what happens. We've already read it, but it's still dramatic to read. Look at verse 26. They took the bull that was given them, and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning till noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, no one answered. 
it's almost like Bale, if he was actually alive, had watched this little show. And he said, meh. Elijah, the prophet of God, does not settle for meh. Let's keep reading, but we'll pick up the narrative at verse 36. At the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. And then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And all the people saw it. They fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. God sends actual fire out of the sky as an answer to Elijah's prayer. And in so doing, the people provide the yes. And God provides the exclamation point. There's no doubt anymore in 1 Kings 18 who the real God is. The idols of the people are nothing. The God of Elijah is everything. And even though bulls and sacrifices and altars aren't part of our lives, the choice of which God to serve still very much is. You are specifically positioned exactly where the people from 1 Kings 18 were. As a junior high student, you face the question, will you live for God with your life? Now, you may be in the no period category when it comes to spiritual life with God. The Bible teaches that all people are born into that category as sinners. We reject God. We go our own way. The Bible calls that rebellion against God sin, and it teaches that death and hell wait for each person who sins. We have all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, so death and hell wait for each of us in our natural state. The Bible also teaches that God is not willing that anyone should perish in hell without him. And so he has made a way of escape for us, a way of salvation for us. That way of escape was to substitute the death of Jesus in the place of our own. And God promises that anyone who will accept the substitution of Jesus' death in place of their own Believing in faith that God is pleased to accept that on behalf of their own death, that person will be forgiven and will be saved. I would encourage you, I would urge you, if you've never repented of your sins and made that a saving reality of your life, to do so now. You already have my email address. You already have Paul's phone number at camp. I promise you, if you have questions, if you want help, Either one of us would love to talk to any camper, any sibling, any parent that knows they need to repent and wants to be saved. I also know that some of you are in the yes with an exclamation point category. You are like Elijah. You want to live for God. You are distressed by the people around you who don't. My encouragement to you is to keep going. Keep looking to Jesus for help and hope and a life of worship to him. For you, I had sermons planned about the glories of Christian living, about the eternal rewards God promises to his people. And those we'll have to keep until next summer. Maybe I'll see you there at camp for them. But having said all of that, I also know there are a lot of you in the third section when it comes to living with God, the meh section. What you should have seen from 1 Kings 18 is there is no meh option with God. If God is God, Elijah said, then serve him. It's either yes with an exclamation point or no, period. This isn't kale. This isn't coffee or art class. There's no meh when it comes to life with God. And it was my hope, my prayer, that through our time together at camp this summer, you would have come to see that. And that you would have come to live a life of radical obedience to him. The biggest challenge facing a junior high student right now. This is the last part of our game answers that you're going to need. The biggest challenge facing a junior high student right now is being a yes with an exclamation point 
follower of Jesus in a world that wants you to be a meh, I guess, type of person. I pray that you will go into the world of junior high this year and that you will become a yes with an exclamation point person when it comes to life with God. And I want to pray for you right now that God will make that happen in your life and in mine. So let's pray and ask him for that help. For God, right now, I, I thank you so much for Camp Barakel. Uh, I thank you for the staff and the leaders. I thank you for the campers and their families. I thank you for their commitment to being yes with an exclamation point Christians. And I pray that you will help us, each camper, each parent, each sibling, each chapel speaker watching this today to mimic that commitment, to be Elijah in their world, to that we will serve you with the way that we live, to repent of our sin, that we will trust you as Savior, acknowledge you as Lord, live life for you, the God who is there, the God who cares. I pray that you will help us by your Holy Spirit to make these things a reality of life, as we look forward to the time that we can come back to camp once again and tell each other all about them. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Well, campers, that's it for now. You know what to do. I'll be looking for your emails, and I'll be praying God's best for you. So long for now. I'll see you at camp.